It's basically a beauty contest for brains and a beauty contest for brevity. You've got two minutes to tell us all the exciting things that you're doing. I think this research achieves is a significant leap in scientific thinking away from um, the view that the mind works simply like a computer and to actually link um, our mind with our bodies and our experience in the world. Okay, remember the last time you, uh, you got lost probably in UCL, the first time that you came to school. Uh, the question is, how were you able to find yourself and reorient? Well, it turns out that uh, by studying these, uh, what I call champion navigators, rats, we can understand how neurons in the brain can enable us to navigate very efficiently. So say for instance, these are the neurons. So something if I hear in the oscilloscope, we would go like And then when the animal faces in a different direction, those neurons get inhibited, and the other ones for a different orientation increase their activity. My dissertation is trying to find all these threads and they link them all together to see how is that works. All the question of time, duplicity and everything comes together. We've been known for a while that dietary restriction, that is a reduction of food intake without malnutrition, extends lifespan in a number of different organisms and this has been demonstrated in yeast, uh, rodents and monkeys. So the fruit fly uh, has been shown to extend lifespan uh, under various conditions, including dietary restriction. Uh, the fruit fly actually sh shares 60% of its DNA with humans, hence my t-shirt. <laughs> I wasn't just publicly rating myself. <laughs> uh, I'm a CS student of nanotechnology and regenerative medicine here at UCL, and I'm going to talk to you about building human ears. Uh, to address this problem, we are developing a new ear scaffold, an off-the-shelf ear scaffold, so the surgeon doesn't have to borrow cartilage and carve it. So my thesis, my research is all about um, East Germany, or the GDR as it's also known. Now East Germany is a country that's defined by its borders. When people think about East Germany, they think about the Berlin Wall, they think about people not being able to leave. Then when I saw this picture that's behind us here, it's of the, um, the destination route map of the East German state airline. And you see destinations on it like uh, Vienna and Vietnam. And so that got me thinking, who did travel to Vienna and Vietnam? My, project, my PhD is about looking at friction mechanisms between skin and non-woven fabrics. But what does it have to do with this? Now, many of the people who have urinary incontinence use, um, absor uh, commonly use absorbent products such as incontinence pads and diapers. Unfortunately, when you use these products on a long-term basis, it can lead to quite bad skin damage, um, which is partly due to friction between the skin and non-woven fabric, which is the soft upper top sheet of the pad or diaper. We are a collaborative and interdisciplinary team. Um, we have planners, um, artists, anthropologists, computer scientists, geographers, and our job is to work together and through our individual projects, contribute to the foundations of a new concept, extreme citizen science, which will enable anyone, whether as an individual, as a group, or as a community, to start their own um, research project. So imagine that you are one of the judges in an Athenian court, a morning of 355 BCE, judging a high-profile political trial against a very prominent Athenian politician, namely Anurtio. I like my project because my patients are amazing. Remember, many of them, they are bone cancer patients. They are sick, but they still want to contribute towards my project by donating blood. They are my motivation to work hard. Thank you. Hello, so for my PhD project, I have designed and developed the world's first synthetic windpipe. So in more detail, cancer, trauma and other diseases can cause narrowing of your airway. The current treatment for narrowing of the airway is surgery to remove the damaged area, bring up the lungs and reattach the two remaining ends. However, as you can imagine, there's only so much you can bring up the lungs. So this is limited to very small lesions and small tumours. So if a patient has a tumour that's larger than this, over 30% of the trachea, uh, there's currently a, a windpipe replacement is required, but there's currently no clinical options available. So I work in UCL Centre of Nanotechnology and Regenerative Medicine. And over the last 15 years, our group has des designed and developed a family of novel and um, new generation materials. And we're currently, uh, we're currently um, applying these to many different surgical applications, some of which you can see behind me. And my project is to design a synthetic windpipe. 
So I've designed a windpipe that is biocompatible, which means that the patient won't reject it. It's non-immunogenic, which means the patient doesn't need immunosuppression drugs for the rest of his or her life, which can have a very negative impact on his life. Um, and also it has the perfect mechanical properties, so the implant won't collapse over time, um, which has been the problem with a lot of other implants that have been tried in the past. So in June last year, uh, we, I made it, was approached by a surgeon in Stockholm, and he asked us to make a windpipe for his patient. The patient had primary cancer of his airway, and we designed a tailor-made trachea for him. And he's now one, one year after the surgery, he's doing really well, he's completely cancer-free, and he's able to return to a normal life with his family and friends. And actually, a few months ago, he completed his own PhD. Thank you very much. Hi, guys. Before we head into this uh, presentation, I wanted to remind you of another historic match of England versus Sweden. Um, Picture here is a bloody Terry Butcher, who was a central defense for England, and he played in a qualifying match versus Sweden. By the end of the match, he was actually totally bloodied up from this uh, cut he sustained earlier. And uh, even though, despite this, his efforts resulted in his team progressing to the semifinals of the 1990 World Cup, uh, the semifinals, sorry, um, because of his constant heading of the ball. Uh, this kit, covered in blood and sweat, poses a number of conservation issues, such as, does the blood actually define the value of this kit? If it's collected, should it have been cleaned? And what is best for the object itself? Because many people collect their own kits and jerseys. So my research will focus on this specific but significant aspect of popular heritage in Europe. Um, it will be of particular interest to football club collections, However, it would also be applicable to even those who are casual collectors. My research has several interrelated focuses, including what does cultural heritage consist of at football club museums, what are the conservation issues related to these collections, and what are the attitudes towards preservation and collections and conservation at these institutions. Um, many assume them to just include ephemera and kits and uh, balls, but there are also very diverse collections, including things like director's chairs and uh, the director's box phone, as well as golf clubs. While no conclusions will be presumed as to what attitude towards conservation should be taken, I will work towards producing practical recommendations on how to raise collections care awareness, improve preservation practices, and increase accessibility to the materials within these collections. It is my goal that this cultural heritage will be around for as long as the glory of the team, of whatever team you support, is. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, so I'd like to imagine for a moment that you're pregnant or your wife or your partner's pregnant for the first time and you're off to have your routine scan and you're desperate to find out if you're having a boy or a girl and you're uh, looking forward to taking a little photo home and then the sonographer turns to you and says, hold on there's something wrong, your baby's smaller than it should be the blood flow between the placenta and the baby is, isn't normal. Well, this is fetal growth restriction, and it's, it's a cruel condition because normally the mother is entirely healthy, the baby's otherwise normal, but the placenta simply doesn't develop enough. There isn't enough blood going to the baby to bring the oxygen and the nutrients that the baby needs to grow. And some babies, like the one on the top left here, do make it, albeit very small and... and um, and skinny like that, but many actually never reach a viable birth weight. They never get big enough to survive outside the womb. And at the moment, parents only have the choice of terminating the pregnancy or watching their baby die in the womb. So is there anything we can do? At the moment, no. There's no treatment, but hopefully that's going to change. And what I've been doing in my PhD is using gene therapy. So the little thing on the right there is an adenovirus, a common cold virus. We've modified it. We've stuck the VEGF gene in it. VEGF is a naturally occurring protein that in, um, helps increase blood flow. And we've in, introduced that into the uterus, and uh, that's increased the blood flow to the baby, brought those essential oxygen and nutrients. And uh, in the sh growth restricted sheep pregnancies that you see there, we actually managed to make these, these uh, lambs grow, and they were bigger after birth. And so this is still a little way off um, being taken into the clinic, but um, it's certainly really encouraging, and hopefully we're looking at what might be the first ever treatment for this horrible condition. Thank you. Thank you.